This tutorial is a project of nonprofitaccountingbasics.org, a free resource developed by the Greater Washington Society of CPAs Educational Foundation. Our goal is to encourage accuracy and accountability to help smaller nonprofits successfully manage and sustain their organizations. I'm Eric Frank, president and founder of your part time controller, and also a member of the Greater Washington Society of CPAs. Nonprofit Financial Accountability Task Force. Today's webinar is titled Internal Controls Part One. This is uh, the first part of a two part uh, uh, series of webinars. Today we're going to talk about a practical guide to internal controls. What are they? Why do you need them? And we'll give some examples of some basic internal controls. So, uh, internal controls, we hear about them all the time, but what are they? Uh, why do our organizations need them? In this short presentation, we'll answer these questions and we're going to discuss uh, a series of practical examples that organizations of all sizes should have. So let's start with a very basic definition of internal controls. Uh, I sometimes refer to these as the four P's. Internal controls are the policies, procedures, processes, and practices that govern how an organization operates. And with respect to internal controls, these policies, procedures, processes, and practices help the organization to safeguard its assets, ensure that work is done in accordance with management's wishes, and to be sure that transactions are properly reflected on its financial reports. Uh, different internal control challenges are presented by organizations of different sizes. Uh, to help illustrate this, we're actually going to take a look at the life cycle of a nonprofit organization. We're going to look at the organization when it is brand new and what its internal control environment will look like. And then as this organization grows somewhat into a small organization and the challenges that a small organization faces. And then we'll briefly take a look at medium and large organizations and talk about some of their internal control challenges. So the new organization, typical scenario, uh, a single person, uh, most likely the executive director is performing all functions. He or she is maintaining the cash, paying the bills, signing the checks, depositing the money. Uh, if there's billing involved, the executive director might be the person doing all the billing and producing financial reports. So what are the risks involved? Are the assets being safeguarded? Is work being done in accordance with management's wishes? Well, in a new organization where everything is being done by the executive director, one might think that internal controls are fairly simple and straightforward, and, and they are. Uh, we don't, the executive director doesn't have to worry about what bills are being paid because the executive director is paying the bills. The executive director doesn't have to worry about his money being deposited into the bank because the executive director is the one depositing the money. However, even for a brand new organization, there is a board of directors, and the board of directors needs to be sure that all of these processes and procedures are being handled and processed correctly. Well, uh, as simple as the internal control structure might be, uh, hopefully this organization now gets some more funding, they have more revenue, and now they evolve into a small organization and uh, chances are the executive director decides at some point that uh, they have other more important things they have to do. They have to fundraise, they have to run programs, so they hire a bookkeeper. Or maybe they have a volunteer board member, but let's assume that the uh, executive director has now hired a bookkeeper. And now the uh, ED is one step removed from all of the basic processes of the organization. Now somebody else is handling the cash. Somebody else uh, is paying the bills. Somebody else is depositing the money. Someone else is doing the accounting and preparing financial reports. The uh, executive director and of course the board now has an added layer of internal controls that are needed to help ensure that these things are being done correctly and properly and appropriately. So things are now starting to get a little bit more complex. The executive director and uh, the board are now an extra step removed from the person who is doing all of the transaction processing. 
Well, now imagine that this organization continues to grow and uh, it becomes a medium or large-sized organization. Now there could be any number of people uh, working <clears throat> in different departments and uh, in different physical locations, uh, perhaps with operations in other countries. Uh, there could be people, uh, the, the office receptionist might be the person who's opening the mail and somebody else in one department might be approving bills for their department. And maybe a program manager is approving uh, <clears throat> bills to be paid for, for their program. And there could be more than one person in the accounting department. There could be two, three, four or more people in the accounting department. They're performing all the accounting. They're processing all the bills. They're preparing the financial functions. Now, how do we know the cash is being handled correctly? How do we know that everything else is being done properly? Now we have, now, now we have an added layer of complexity. And I mentioned that we could be operating in other countries. Imagine this organization is doing work abroad. We have clients that have operations in uh, the Middle East and in Asia and in Africa. And in some of these places, the banking system is not as sophisticated and as well developed as it might be here in the US. And their economies might be more of a cash basis economy. Imagine now from an office here in the States trying to control transactions in a foreign country that are being handled perhaps largely on a cash basis. This is a serious internal control uh, challenge. Okay, so what are some basic internal controls that uh, our organizations, uh, your organizations might implement? Uh, one of the very basic uh, axioms of internal control is segregation of duties. And the theory is very simple, that one person acting alone might be able to steal, might be able to make mistakes, unintentional perhaps, that are undetected. But if we separate out these duties into two or more people, uh, that could potentially mitigate the opportunities for either one person acting alone to uh, misappropriate assets of the organization or to make mistakes of one sort or another. There's always the possibility of collusion. Collusion is where two or more people might get together and decide to uh, do something that they shouldn't be doing. But certainly, as we begin to segregate duties, it helps to mitigate that possibility. Uh, and part of segregation of duties, we talk about custody of assets versus the recording of the assets. Uh, so if uh, uh, checks are arriving in the mail, perhaps the person who is handling the checks and taking the checks to the bank or seeing to it that they're being deposited, uh, that shouldn't necessarily be the same person who's responsible for the accounting for those checks. A separation of custody versus recording. Uh, if the organization has fixed assets, and what organization doesn't have computers and, and other fixed assets, property and equipment of one sort or another, ideally you'd like to have the person or people who are responsible for safeguarding those assets be separate from the person who is responsible for the recording of those assets. Uh, dual signatures on checks, uh, very common internal control. Uh, should there be one person who signs all checks or should there be more than one person who signs all checks? And uh, if there's uh, adding a second signer uh, is a way to help safeguard that only those bills that are appropriate to be paid are being paid. And later uh, uh, in part two, we're going to talk about how many check signers should be needed and, and what the limit should be. But dual signers is an example of segregation of duties. Uh, you know, there's always an issue in, uh, about small organizations. Uh, how do small organizations achieve segregation of duties uh, when there might only be one person in the accounting department and he or she is doing everything. How do you have segregation of duties? Well, we don't have time to get into a long explanation of that. There are ways that perhaps things can be split up. Uh, uh, without sounding too self-serving, uh, there are outside accountants who might be hired to come in, uh, such as our firm, who could help with that process and take over some of the duties to help provide some segregation. More examples of basic internal controls. Uh, there needs to be documentation, documentation for transactions. Uh, if, uh, tra if cash is being transacted or uh, whatever, if money is changing hands, there should be receipts. 
there needs to be a system of proper approvals. Uh, who gets, who has the authority to approve invoices for payment? Uh, who has the authority to add new accounts to the chart of accounts? Who has authority to sign checks? Uh, there's a whole system of approvals that can be put into place with payment of payroll. Who is, uh, who has the approval authority to decide who goes on to payroll and who is checking the payroll to make sure that uh, the right people are being paid for the, rights, for the right amounts. Uh, there's also a whole series of outsiders who could help an organization. Of course, there's your year-end audit. Uh, year-end audits is the subject of another webinar that you can find on the website here for the uh, Greater Washington Society, uh, the nonprofit accounting basics, uh, org website. There's another webinar about audits. But, there's, uh, aud but audits provide some level of assurance that things are going well. And organizations may choose to bring in other third-party verifiers. Uh, for example, even at our own accounting firm, uh, once or twice a year, we bring in HR specialists to review our HR records and to make sure we're documenting things that we should be documenting. Uh, and again, the four uh, well, policies, procedures, uh, uh, systems, and so on, uh, processes, uh, all of these need to be documented, they need to be written, uh, and they need to be followed. Uh, merely writing down our policies and, and policies and procedures is not sufficient if we're not also following and implementing those uh, systems. Uh, staff training. Uh, no system of internal controls will be adequate without uh, the proper staff receiving the proper training. Uh, has your staff been trained to know what their internal controls are? Uh, do they know that the internal controls are operating the way they should? You know, if, if you are a board member or if you are the executive director, you may think that you've got certain internal controls in place, uh, but we run into situations all the time at uh, clients and other organizations where they discover, oftentimes to their horror, uh, that uh, what they thought was in place was not actually being followed. So your internal controls need a feedback loop so that you know that these things are actually being done, the things that should be done. Uh, does your staff even have the necessary technical skills to handle their responsibilities? Uh, as an accountant, when we deal with accounting and financial reporting, we see all the time organizations make the mistake of asking people on their staffs who don't know a debit from a credit to do their accounting and bookkeeping. And then they are all surprised when the financial reports that are being produced are inaccurate. How could that happen? We have accounting software and, and such. How could our reports be uh, wrong? Well, are your people, do they have the proper training? Do they have the proper technical expertise? Uh, very important, and I save this for uh, one, of, uh, one, of our, one of my last slides, is uh, the tone has to be set at the top. And when we say the top, uh, we're talking about the board, the executive director, and other management. Uh, if the, the, the staff has to see that the folks at the top are serious about strong internal controls and that they are conscientious not only in setting strong controls, but also following these controls. For example, if the executive director is insisting that um, uh, all expense reports submitted by staff have to be properly documented with receipts attached, and then if the executive director, uh, his or herself, is submitting expense reports without receipts, well, that shows a, uh, a lack of conscientiousness in terms of following their system of internal control. So very important, the tone has to be set at the top. And the staff knows whether the people at the top are serious or not about internal controls. All right, well, what are the consequences of uh, weak internal controls? Well, all kinds of uh, things can happen from the minor to the very serious. Uh, uh, you know, we talk about risk and what and where is the risk. Uh, there could be uh, fraud or embezzlement or purposeful financial report misrepresentations or other intentional acts. Uh, if your system of internal controls is weak, these things could happen. Uh, there could also be accidental errors and unintentional acts. Quite frankly, when we see, we go into an organization and uh, we see errors or problems with their financial reporting, uh, it, almost always it's accidental. It, it's not someone intentionally trying to misrepresent something. They just don't know necessarily 
what, uh, how, what, uh, how to properly represent information on these financial reports. Uh, there could be inefficiencies and waste entered into uh, that creep into the, an organization. As these inefficiencies and waste increase, there's a loss of opportunities to provide all the program services that should be provided to your constituents. There are all kinds of legal consequences and liability. Uh, for example, with payroll, uh, suppose for some reason your organization fails to pay payroll taxes on time. Uh, well, there are all kinds of potential legal liability issues there for staff and for the board. And of, co of course, there's always the possibility that things can be so bad that your organization could be forced to close. And this is a reality. Uh, I'll, hardly a month goes by or an issue of the Chronicle of Philanthropy and, and other uh, uh, nonprofit journals goes by where there's not some story about a fraud or at, that's occurring at a nonprofit somewhere uh, that has forced the organization to close. Uh, I'm recording this webinar in April of 2015, and there's uh, some several notorious cases in New York where uh, some very large uh, nonprofits uh, wake up one day to find out that millions of dollars are missing. How does that happen? That uh, all of a sudden you find out that over a course of months or even years, millions of dollars has gone missing. Well, there are probably many reasons why that's happening, but, but among the reasons why that's happening is a lack of a, uh, a good system of internal controls. So uh, this has been part one. In part two, we're going to now look at the flip side of all of this uh, internal control talk. Uh, we, we now know why internal controls are important. We know why they're needed, and we've talked about some examples. In part two, we're going to look at the opposite, how uh, it is possible to have too much of a good thing. It is possible to go too far in implementing two, uh, internal controls, and no system of internal controls, no matter how good, is perfect. So for more help, uh, I invite you to uh, look at the website for uh, nonprofitaccountingbasics.org. This is run by the Greater Washington Society of CPAs. Uh, there's lots of uh, information on there. There's, there are articles, and there's a growing library of videos. Uh, I encourage you to look there. And of course, you're always welcome to reach out to me, Eric Frank, president and founder of your part-time controller. So thank you very much.